Good afternoon. My name is Whitney Isaac. I'm the MLA for Calgary Glenmore. I just want to start off today with a with a uh, land acknowledgement that we are here on Treaty 7 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot uh, nations, the Kainai, Pikani, and Siksika, along with Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda First Nation, as well as the uh, Region 3 Métis. So welcome to Calgary Glenmore and welcome to the Rocky View Hospital that you see behind me here. This is an important landmark for our constituency and, and for many Calgarians. And like many people in my community, three generations of my family have received care from this hospital. My children were also born here and I'm very pleased to be here for this announcement today. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce the Honourable Jason Kenney, Premier of Alberta. Well, thank you very much, uh, Whitney, and uh, thanks to everybody from the Rock View for welcoming us here to this uh, great vista. I um, will get to the subject of today's announcement in a moment, but uh, before doing so, I wanted to address a couple of, uh, of other pressing issues. First of all, I'm very happy to report that yesterday in a three to nothing decision, the Federal Court of, Appro of Appeal ruled in Alberta's favor on a critical decision uh, protecting our uh, pre Canada's Economic Prosperity Act, uh, which some have called the uh, Turn Off the Taps legislation. This is legislation that was brought in a little over two years ago to allow Alberta uh, to control exports of our natural resources, uh, and it gave us an additional tool in our toolkit uh, to respond to other jurisdictions that might seek to landlock our resources. Uh, I'm happy that uh, since that legislation was brought in, uh, first of all, uh, our government uh, in its very first act, uh, within hours of being sworn in, proclaimed that into law. Uh, it was subsequently challenged by the BC government uh, and yesterday's three to nothing decision by the Federal Court of Appeal uh, uh, re removed an earlier injunction. Uh, and uh, so it's a very important tool uh, to allow us to protect the value of our resources and we're uh, delighted with the outcome of that. On another matter, uh, as you know, on uh, Sunday the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo declared a state of local emergency and local First Nations in uh, northwest, uh, northeast Alberta have also expressed uh, concerns about uh, the high level of COVID-19 spread in the region. And uh, our government has been working closely with local leadership. I know that uh, Minister Shandro and Dr. Hinshaw uh, met with uh, Mayor Don Scott uh, yesterday at, by phone and uh, earlier today with First Nations leaders. I've been in touch as well uh, with local leadership. And uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, we uh, uh, have seen a significant number of vaccine doses uh, going unused and that's why the de decision has been made to expand uh, extend vaccine uh, hours uh, to 10 p.m. Uh, in Fort McMurray uh, and uh, to continue to work with the community to make sure that there is uh, high uptake with those life-saving vaccines. Uh, but in addition, Dr. Hinshaw has uh, recommended and uh, Minister Chandra and I have accepted the following recommendations. Um, first of all, we will begin, we're scheduled to begin receiving the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine uh, as of next Monday at the beginning of May and so we will direct all doses of that vaccine uh, received in the next two weeks as supply permits uh, to the two highest incident areas in the pandemic which are currently the rural municipality of Wood Buffalo and uh, Banff uh, in, uh, in order to help accelerate vaccine coverage in those areas. We'll develop strategies with the leadership of those communities to address vaccine hesitancy and encourage greater uh, vaccine uptake and, and also make it more convenient, as I've mentioned, as we've already done in Fort McMurray. And uh, we will be setting an eligibility age of at 30 years of age and older in these areas for the AstraZeneca and uh, Janssen vaccines. So, as you know, currently the minimum age uh, province-wide is 40. That's based on the uh, scientific advice of the uh, National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Uh, but Dr. Hinshaw, in consultation with uh, uh, experts, has decided that uh, accelerating the vaccination program in those communities, which also happen to be have younger populations, 
would be uh, helpful in addressing uh, the outbreaks. And uh, finally, we'll be lowering the eligibility age for the Moderna vaccine in ad adjacent First Nations and Métis communities uh, within that zone uh, to 30 years of age. Um, so that's a, uh, a significant reduction. Uh, of course, uh, we have been from the very beginning uh, providing uh, earlier age access to uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines to Indigenous Albertans, uh, First Nations and Métis people uh, because uh, they've had more challenging health outcomes and this uh, decision that we've accepted from Dr. Hinshaw uh, further reflects that. So with that, thank you for joining us today and I'm here outside the Rocky View Hospital in Calgary to speak about Alberta's historic commitment uh, to health care in this great province. I'm joined by uh, colleagues Whitney Isaac, as you've heard from, uh, Health Minister Tyler Shandro, Infrastructure Minister Prasad Panda, and I also want to uh, recognize Dr. Ted Braun, Vice President Medical Director for Central and Southern Alberta at Alberta Health Services, and Dr. Kelly D'Souza, Clinical Director of the Rocky View Hospital. I also especially look forward to hearing from uh, Mike Meldrum, President and CEO of the Calgary Health Foundation, who will speak about that foundation's partnership uh, in our announcement, and a heartfelt thanks to Krista DeVoe, a, a young woman from the Calgary area who will be sharing her journey of living with Crohn's disease and needing access to special health services in our province. Such stories of uh, hope and resilience help us all to recognize and to better understand the amazing public health care that Alberta offers to all of its people. In Budget 2021, Alberta's government made an historic investment, the highest ever spending in health care by far in Alberta history, to protect the lives and livelihoods of Albertans. This includes a $23 billion investment this year in health care, uh, as I say, the largest single uh, investment in history Plus, in addition to that, an extra one and a quarter billion dollars in contingency fighting to, to support uh, the battle against COVID-19. Our plan to protect lives and livelihoods also provides a three-year, $2.2 billion commitment to health infrastructure projects. This funding supports our ongoing work on projects dear to the hearts of so many Albertans, including the new Grand Prairie Regional Hospital and the Calgary Cancer Centre. It also commits $143 million for five new projects, uh, including the remediation of the old High Prairie Health Complex to make space for new, new development uh, for the health system there. We're also building a new mater maternity and community health centre to serve the needs of the growing northern community of La Crete. And three exciting uh, projects moving forward here in Calgary we're expanding the neonatal intensive care unit here um, in Calgary at the Foothills Hospital, and we're building a new cyclotron and radio pharmaceutical manufacturing facility also in Calgary, the first of its kind in Southern Alberta. And finally, the reason that we are here today, we're providing $59 million over the next three years to upgrade and expand the Rocky View Hospital's intensive care unit, the coronary care unit, and the gastrointestinal clinic. Each year, these units care for many more critically ill patients than the spaces that they were built for years ago. And that's why we're expanding them to ensure that people and families living in Calgary and the surrounding areas will have better access to top quality intensive care, coronary care for heart, heart problems, and diagnosis and treatment for a host of gastrointestinal issues. Uh, Minister Chandra will provide details on, on these investments in a moment, but we know that as our population ages, more people will need improved access to screening programs for things like colon and lung cancer. And so many Albertans already struggle with Crohn's disease, with inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome, and need access to non-surgical procedures, services and care. So thanks to a generous contribution from Calgary's Health Foundation, this project will double the size of the Rocky View's gastrointestinal clinic. Regular Albertans stepped forward, dug into their own pockets, and are now partnering with Alberta's government on priority projects like this one at Rocky View that will improve their health and their access to medical services. All told, expanding the ICU the coronary care unit and the gastrointestinal clinic at the Rocky View 
means that thousands more people from southern Alberta will a have access to the care that they need when they need it and where they need it. More hospital beds, more access to complex health services, more space for patients, uh, doctors and nurses, more suites for non-surgical procedures. This project is part of Alberta's ongoing commitment to improve public health care and to build a health system around the needs of patients and families. Projects like these will also spur much needed growth and will help our economic uh, recovery as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, putting people to work expanding these facilities. We are investing not just in the health of our residents, but in the health of our broader economy. Investing now in priority capital projects like this one at the Rocky View Hospital and many others across the province is investing in a sustainable health system that will serve Albertans well into the future. So thank you very much. And uh, with that, I look forward to uh, more details from Ministers Chandra and, and Panda and then uh, to hear from our other guests here today. Well, thank you, Premier. And thank you to Whitney for uh, welcoming us to uh, Calgary Glenmore. Well, I think uh, Acadia is just across the street there. Uh, but uh, it is great to be back at the, uh, the Rocky View. Uh, like Whitney, both of my kids were uh, born here as, uh, as well. So it's great to be back here. Um, a quick mention uh, as well that today is uh, April 28th and, and therefore the, the National Day of Mourning as we remember workers who are killed or sickened or uh, hurt after work-related incidents. And uh, in particular, Zolt Varga who is uh, an advanced care paramedic, who is a passionate advocate, not just of uh, patients, but of his uh, fellow paramedics. Um, and thank you, Premier, for joining us today. It's great to, to hear from you directly um, about government's commitment to support and to continue to build a world-class health system that's centered on the needs of patients and their families. Uh, I'm delighted that this work here at the Rocky View is, is a part of that work. And each year, the ICU admits about 275 patients into the, the 10 beds providing specialized care for the sickest patients. The coronary care unit, or the CCU, with its seven beds is also incredibly busy, caring for close to 540 patients each year who need critical care after a heart attack or after a surgery. Uh, together, the two units for a quarter of the, the time care for patients more than their nominal capacity and they manage occupancy as high as 130%. Now, to be clear, ICUs and other units do sometimes go over 100% at their peak times, and that's not new, but this is too much. It's a problem that needs to be fixed, and we are fixing it. This project will expand the ICU and the CCU to two, uh, 25 beds, all in single patient rooms, up from the current number of 17. So from 17 to 25 of these beds. And it will move the units into a combined and updated unit that will be a better space for patients and a better space for the, the staff who, who work in them. We're also very pleased to partner with, uh, as Premier said, the, the Calgary Health Foundation to expand the gastrointestinal clinic. And this is urgently needed since Alberta has a very high rate of Crohn's disease as well as rates of inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel uh, syndrome. The clinic's four endoscopy suites consistently run at 90% of capacity, providing colonoscopies and, and other procedures to detect changes or abnormalities in the, uh, the digestive system in a patient. Now the, the GI clinic is near capacity right now and they expect to see another 36% uh, increase um, by the time we get to 2030. So they need more space and that's why we're doubling the size of the clinic, including two more endoscopy suites to allow them to do 4,000 more procedures each year. And the new space will make it easier to meet the current standards for infection prevention, uh, or, or, um, infection, uh, sorry, um, infection prevention and control as well as isolation and it will support the unit's role in teaching and training staff and physicians 
and it will give patients and families more space and more privacy during visits and consultations with their care team. So thank you to everyone at the Rocky View. Thank you to the physicians, to the staff, to the volunteers, to the managers who work so hard to give Calgarians the very best care anywhere. And thanks uh, to all of the, the generous Albertans who have supported the hospital through the Calgary Health Foundation. I'd like to now welcome Minister Ponda to the podium to talk about this project and its impacts on the economy here in Calgary. Thank you, Minister Schrander, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you today in the riding of uh, Calgary Glenmore, and I want to acknowledge my good friend, uh, Emily Whitney Isaac, for, uh, such, for being such a strong advocate for projects like this uh, in uh, Calgary area. Um, and it's uh, my pleasure to discuss about the impact that the Rocky View General Hospital project will uh, have on our Calgary community. Budget 2021 allocated uh, $59 million over the next three years for this uh, project behind us. And I would like to acknowledge the Calgary Health Foundation for their generous uh, $10 million contribution. And this project is expected to support over 410 good uh, paying construction and construction related jobs throughout the duration of this uh, project. The project will develop 34,000 square feet of uh, shell space that was previously built in 2010, allowing for future expansion when required. And that time is now. Design activity will get underway this summer, and construction will start in 2022 and uh, will be completed in 2024. Throughout the pandemic, our government has focused on protecting Albertans' lives and livelihoods. When uh, planning budget 2021, we knew we had to invest uh, building and maintaining public infrastructure to address the future needs of Albertans and to get Albertans working. And if you observed uh, the last 14 months in Alberta, construction never stopped. So Premier wanted us to make sure that uh, uh, the livelihoods uh, continue. And that's why Budget 2021 is uh, focused on protecting Albertans' lives and livelihoods. We know the importance of keeping Albertans working so they can support their families and their communities can thrive. The Rocky View General Hospital Project will not only address an identified health need here in Calgary, it will also help support good paying jobs generating investment in our communities and is an integral part of Alberta's recovery plan. Uh, as, as you remember, Alberta's recovery plan invested $10 billion last year in uh, vital uh, infrastructure projects, and this year we approved $20.7 billion to be invested in infrastructure during the next three years. A good portion of the wages paid to workers are spent in local businesses and services, helping friends and neighbors by keeping people working and supporting the local economy. Through Budget 2021, we are building the health and public infrastructure that Albertans will need as we emerge from the grip of the pandemic. And as we take our position as an economic leader in, uh, in Canada, as the Minister of Infrastructure, I can assure you that I will closely monitor the development of this project because uh, Premier, every time I see him, he keeps asking if all these projects are on time, on budget. So I'll be a pain in the neck for Minister Shandro to, uh, to allocate his resources and partner with Alberta Infrastructure to get these projects built on time, on budget. Um, I look forward to the day when we all will gather here again to celebrate the opening of this uh, new facility. 
I, I would also like to thank Hayden for picking up this beautiful uh, location today. And now I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kelly DeSoja from Alberta Health Services to come to the podium. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Premier Kenny, Mr. Panda, and Minister Shandro. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ted Braun. I'm the uh, Vice President and Medical Director of Clinical Operations with Alberta Health Services. And I'm very pleased to be here together with Dr. Kelly uh, D'Souza, the Medical Director for the Rocky View, uh, to represent Dr. Verna Yu, uh, our President and CEO, our entire executive, as well as our board, um, in celebrating this very significant impact this investment will have on the thousands of patients and families who receive care here at the Rocky View every year. This upgrade is to one of the is to one of the city's busiest adult acute care sites. is an important step in decreasing wait times, improving patient outcomes, and increasing capacity. We're very grateful to the government of Alberta and the Calgary Health Foundation for their support in making these improvements possible. Relocating and expanding the Rocky View's GI clinic will enable the hospital to add a new procedure room, as Minister Shandro mentioned, and double the space and capacity. This will ease capacity pressures and allow for more flexibility in caring for patients with complex needs. Once expanded the GI clinic, we anticipate providing more than 14,500 procedures every year, a significant increase over our current capacity. We will also improve wait times to meet targets established by the Canadian Gastroenterology Society for urgent priority endoscopies, reducing the current four-week window to just two weeks. The demand for diagnosis and treatment for digestive disorders has climbed steadily over the years. With the realization of this new clinic, we are very excited to play a pivotal role in meeting that demand through expanded and enhanced care. Expanded and enhanced care also describes what patients and families can expect through the dramatically redesigned and integrated ICU and coronary care unit, or CCU, here at the Rocky View. It's been about 26 years since the last significant upgrade was made to the Rocky View's ICU. Not surprisingly, the dozens of staff and physicians who provide care to the almost 1,100 patients admitted to the ICU and CCU each year are very excited about their future home and what it means for patient care. This investment will increase ICU capacity from 10 to 14 beds and CCU capacity from 7 to 10 beds. Not only are we adding more beds, we're also creating a better, safer experience with larger patient care rooms to support critical life-saving equipment. A good example of this is the integration of bariatric support equipment. This will allow us to better meet the needs of bariatric patients while supporting the health and wellness of care providers. All patient care rooms will also have individual washrooms and windows. Exposure to natural daylight is well documented in the scientific literature to be instrumental in mitigating and managing delirium or confusion in patients. With a large part of the ICU's quality improvement work focused on minimizing delirium in critically ill patients, this is a meaningful step we will take in enhancing patient care. Additional aspects of the new unit include a dedicated family space with sleeping area, kitchenette, washrooms with showers, more quiet rooms for loved ones to visit with patients, and an outdoor patio for patients and families to enjoy fresh air. This is a really important feature for long-stay ICU patients in particular. A joint ICU and CCU will result in significant efficiencies through an integrated staffing model that will support shared resources and the ability to respond quickly to changing needs. 
We also expect the unit to attract top talent as it will offer a unique opportunity for healthcare professionals to work in a diverse clinical environment with both cardiology and critical care. In closing, I would like to once again thank you, our government and foundation partners for making these significant improvements at the Rocky View General Hospital. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude to the dedicated physicians, staff, and volunteers at AHS who continue to rise to the unprecedented challenge our province continues to face. Indeed, we're in the midst of wave three of the pandemic. This wave is having a major impact on the tens of thousands of Albertas, Albertans who we rely on every day to provide quality and timely care. But I want to assure you, we are prepared. Despite working tirelessly for more than a year, our incredibly dedicated staff and physicians continue to rise to the challenge. I know I speak on behalf of Dr. Yu and all of HS executive leadership when I say we're very proud of their tremendous resilience and unwavering compassion. Be safe, be kind, and please get vaccinated as soon as you are eligible. I would like now to turn the podium over to Mike Meldrum, the President and CEO of the Calgary Health Foundation. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Braun, and also Premier Kennedy, uh, Kenny, Minister Shandro, and Minister Panda for your commitment to advancing care here at the Rocky View General Hospital and across the Calgary Zone. We're excited to partner with you in these big investments that will impact people across southern Alberta. Sooner or later, and often unexpectedly, we all depend on the healthcare system. And when we do, we want to ensure the best possible outcomes. Today's announcement represents two different aspects of care. One, to enhance diagnostics and treatments that will return quality of life to people living with chronic disease or provide earlier detection and intervention for those facing a life-altering diagnosis. The other, to ensure life-saving intervention is at its best when people need it at their critical moments. Our mission is rejecting the status quo, and Calgary Health Foundation supporters are motivated to ensure that the best possible care is available for our loved ones. Through this collaborative investment with the Government of Alberta, our community will have the most preeminent life-sustaining interventions, diagnostics, and treatments when we need them most. Gastrointestinal condi conditions do not discriminate by age or gender. In fact, many Albertans are at risk and will likely need the care of a GI team at some point in their life. This has led to increasing demand for these services in a space that can no longer accommodate the innovations and best practices available in today's standards of care. That's why Calgary Health Foundation is pleased to commit $12 million to a state-of-the-art space that will offer the highest level of care for GI patients here at the Rocky View General Hospital and throughout their journey with the health system. Today you're going to hear from Krista DeVoe, who due to a chronic condition relies on our health system and services offered by the GI Clinic. This investment by the Calgary Health Foundation is in support of people like Krista who face chronic conditions or will get a diagnosis that will disrupt their lives. Through improved access to these services, it is our collective goal to help patients manage their disease more effectively and improve their overall wellness. I would now like to introduce uh, you to Krista DeVoe uh, for her to share her story.
Good afternoon. My name is Krista. I've been a GI patient here in Calgary for the last eight years. I was diagnosed with an inflammatory bowel disease called Crohn's in my home province of Nova Scotia when I was only nine years old. Since then, I have relied on expert GI services to help manage my condition. I know firsthand the importance of having access to specialized services, especially when living with a chronic bowel disease. I grew up in a small rural community where I had limited resources available to me to help my illness as it progressed and as my needs um, became more complex. But since moving to Calgary in 2013, my level of care has improved greatly because of having readily available GI services at my fingertips. This expansion is a step in the right direction because quicker access to these services means an improved quality of life for so many like me. Over the last 20 years, expert GI services have helped me find the best treatment options, get regular testing, and follow-ups before and after surgery to get a proper diagnosis, and it has played a huge role in my overall care plan. Thanks to these services, my overall quality of life has improved so much in the last couple of years. As someone living with a chronic bowel disease, this expansion at Rocky View General Hospital will be an important step in enhancing care for thousands of Albertans who suffer from these diseases and who rely on quick access to GI services to get proper diagnosis, diagnosis treatments and care. I'm hopeful, hopeful that this announcement will allow patients like me to have less worries about when or if we'll receive care so we can focus more on our future and living our lives as normally as possible. Thank you. Now going to turn over to the phones for questions. We'll have time for two questions each today, either two off the top or one question and one follow up. With that, operator, can you please put through our first caller? This is James Keller with the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, James. James, your line is open. Please go ahead. The caller and try to uh, circle back with James. Okay, sorry, James. We're going to move on to our next caller now, Rick Bell with the Calgary Sun. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, Premier, I just, uh, with all due respect, I have a question that is not about the announcement, even though the announcement I know is very, very important and significant. Um, there have been reports over the weeks by several media outlets of some people within your party who are upset with your leadership. I think you went on the Roy Green show a couple of days ago and uh, addressed a question on that issue. Um, what do you see as... Um, the underlying reasons for this upset, and how, how do you see this sort of shaking out in the future? How do you see this as, as becoming resolved as time goes on? Uh, thanks, Rick. I, I have to say, I'm really not here to talk about politics today, but it's no secret that uh, a minority of Albertans are very upset with public health restrictions that we've had to put in place to save lives and to protect our health care system. I understand that frustration. As I've said before, I'm glad to live in a province where there's a lot of people who uh, jealously guard their freedom and are understandably uh, skeptical about uh, government using extraordinary powers. At the same time, I would say to those folks, whether uh, they are in my political party or elsewhere, that uh, this government has tried uh, as best it can uh, to follow the, uh, the data, the best public health advice, to take a balanced approach with the goals of uh, avoiding uh, preventable deaths, uh, avoiding an overwhelming of our healthcare system, while also uh, trying to minimize the impact of restrictions on our bro the broader health of our society. Uh, maintaining that balance has not been easy. Uh, we have done our best. And uh, what I would also say to folks who are upset about the public health restrictions is once again, um, if you have a loved one who's waiting for surgery, uh, they may have to wait for months longer because of postponements due to the surge in COVID cases. Um, if, if you, you may have a loved one who could become hospitalized from this disease and its more uh, lethal and contagious variants. 
So this is about all of us and uh, coming together as a community. And I really don't uh, think that we should allow politics to divide us uh, as we seek to find a way forward together uh, in what's left of this pandemic. And finally, I would say to people who are frustrated, uh, we are at the 10 yard line. Uh, the, the end is very much in sight, thanks to the vaccines. We've now vaccinated about 30, uh, first dose vaccines have gone to about 38% of adults in Alberta, about a third of our total population, another 10% have some degree of natural immunity from prior infection. So the numbers are going in the right direction, but we've got to get over the hump of this current wave uh, and then uh, uh, be able to enjoy a good Alberta summer. Rick, do you have a quick follow-up? Oh. Yes, a quick follow-up is, uh, Premier, uh, again, with all due respect, I wasn't really asking a question about COVID. I was asking a question about discontent within by some members of your party with your leadership. Now, that might be connected to COVID. Part of it almost surely is. So I wonder if you could just uh, address that, address the issue of there are people yeah, I, who are discontented, they're in your own party, some of them are even in your own caucus, some of it is COVID. How do you see all that? How how do, how do you deal with that, with that situation? Well, Rick, you asked me why I thought some people are upset, and I gave you the answer, which is, I think, primarily, uh, there are uh, free, some freedom-loving Albertans who are very frustrated with the public health restrictions that the government has brought in. I lead the government, and I'm ultimately responsible for those. And so the frustration and anger gets focused on, on me in, that, in this position, understandably so. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think we, when we look back over the past year, uh, we could learn lessons and we would have done some things a bit differently, but overall, um, to, to people, uh, wherever they reside in the political spectrum, who are angry with public health restrictions and focus that anger on this government and on my performance as Premier, I have this to say, what's the alternative? Was the alternative to let the virus run completely loose, to make no reasonable efforts uh, to uh, control viral spread, uh, the, the critics are not responsible for what happens in our healthcare system. They're not responsible for avoiding an overwhelming of our hospitals. The government is, and the government takes that responsibility very seriously and will continue to do so. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Yes, we're going to try James Keller again. Go ahead, James. Hi, thanks for indulging my technical problems here. Um, yesterday, uh, this is a question for the Premier. Yesterday, uh, the leadership of 11 First Nations and Métis communities called for significant public health measures uh, in the Fort Mac area, a curfew, a stay-at-home order, restrictions on non-essential businesses. Is your government considering any of that? We are actively considering additional targeted measures, uh, particularly in some of the hardest-hit areas of the province, including uh, Fort McMurray, Wood Buffalo, uh, and so I know that uh, Minister Shandro uh, spoke with some of those First Nations leaders earlier today. Uh, Indigenous Relations Minister Rick Wilson has been in, in constant contact uh, with First Nations leadership throughout the pandemic. Um, I just announced uh, this, after, this morning, uh, rather this afternoon, that we are going to be providing uh, additional uh, vaccine doses and eligibility at a, uh, uh, the lower age of 30. Uh, we've already, um, from the very beginning, recognized uh, the particular vulnerability of Indigenous and Métis people uh, to this disease, which is why uh, we have had, uh, given that population about a 15-year head start in terms of the age eligibility uh, for the COVID-19 vaccines, and we're, we're expanding that even further now. Um, so I understand and hear their concerns, and as I say, we are uh, actively considering uh, additional targeted measures, uh, particularly in the most hard-hit areas. James, do you have a follow-up? Yes. So when asked about uh, vaccines earlier this week, you singled out uh, vaccine hesitancy among Indigenous people. Is there any evidence that this is a significant source of the current outbreak? I mean, there aren't any outbreaks right now on any of the reserves in the area. Vaccine rates are higher in, uh, among Indigenous people than the general population. So can you just tell me a bit about what was behind those comments? Well, I think you're... Uh somewhat mischaracterizing my comments. Let me quote them for you uh, precisely verbatim. Uh, this was from Monday. I said um, that um, 
we've provided a lot of extra support for that region of uh, Wood Buffalo. Uh, for example, we provided tens of thousands of rapid test kits to some of the oil sands work camps and to help them in detection. And then I said the population up there is disproportionately indigenous and as you know we've had a much lower age eligibility for vaccination uh, for First Nations population. We've done a lot of extra outreach efforts working with the First Nations to address vaccine hesitancy and make it as, a conven as convenient as possible in a culturally sensitive way uh, to deliver those vaccines. Uh, so uh, I, was, I did not claim that, that uh, local reserves or First Nations communities are seeing particular outbreaks, uh, but the, uh, we were responding to concerns being raised uh, by First Nations that you've just reiterated, and they're right to be concerned about the situation in that part of the province. Uh, the point I was making, which I'll restate, is um, that uh, given the, uh, the health sensitivity of, of Indigenous uh, communities to uh, COVID-19, we have provided uh, easier and broader access to vaccines. We've sought to do so in a culturally sensitive way. And when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, that was actually an issue first raised uh, by uh, First Nations chiefs, including uh, Chief Alan Adam and other uh, Treaty 8 chiefs. Uh, I'll point you back to a um, article in CBC that I believe was in February, indicating that uh, a clinic set up in Fort Chippewan for vaccination had about half of the expected uptake and the local Indigenous leadership uh, was making a special call for people and on the government uh, to help to um, address certain misconceptions uh, uh, about the safety of the vaccines. So that's an issue that's been addressed, raised by First Nations leadership. We've tried to work with them uh, collaboratively uh, to uh, educate folks about the safety of the vaccines, uh, to make them available in a culturally sensitive way, locally and conveniently. And uh, today we're taking another step forward in doing so. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Yes, our next question is from Rishi Nagar with Red FM. Go ahead, Rishi. Hi, thank you. Can I, uh, can I request Mr. Panda to, to, to respond to my question, please? You can go ahead and state it, and he'll be up here in a moment. Sure, sir. In the time of uh, economic crisis in Alberta, we do need investment in infrastructure. And what are the various other projects that your Ministry of Infrastructure is investing in, Mr. Thank you, Rishi, for that uh, very timely and sensible question. Uh, I'm uh, happy to share with all the uh, investments. Uh, Government of Alberta uh, is, uh, is busy in uh, investing last two years. Uh, our, our government, is, our focus while uh, saving lives is also at the same time protecting the livelihoods. Like the project here you heard today, uh, we are spending millions on Rocky View, or millions on Foothills uh, uh, Cyclotron and uh, Foothills uh, Power Plant, Cogen Plant, and also Neonatal at uh, Foothills. And you all know $1.4 billion in Calgary Cancer. And then in Calgary, again, there is a long-term uh, um, long care center near Bridgeland. And at Peter Lougheed, we are uh, investing hundreds of millions. So, and also in the capital maintenance and renewal across the province, we have been investing to fix the affordable housing, mitigating flood in Calgary, and there are so many projects. And also in justice infrastructure, we are, uh, we are building a court of appeal uh, new building in Calgary and also in, uh, uh, in uh, Red Deer. The, there is lots happening and also yesterday you would have followed uh, uh, the start of construction at Vivo in, uh, in the north part of uh, Calgary. So there is lots happening. Uh, it's all part of Alberta recovery plan. We're trying to get people back to work. So... Uh, this uh, $20.7 billion investment in the next three years will create almost uh, 90,000 jobs. Thank Thanks for the you. opportunity to share all that uh, uh, investment in uh, public infrastructure. Thank you. And Rishi, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Panda, India is passing through a critical period in, in the face of uh, COVID-19 crisis. The government of Canada has assured to release uh, 
10 million dollars towards Red Cross India. Mr. Panda, you are also active on social media towards providing help to the Indians in distress. Is uh, your government doing also something to help them out? Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, Premier and all of us uh, here, we want to send our uh, sympathies to the families that uh, lost their loved ones in India. They're going through a lot of challenges. Um, I, I also want to thank the uh, Government of Canada for uh, stepping up to help India. Uh, so uh, my understanding is uh, they, they do have uh, oxygen, uh, but they don't have the infrastructure to get it to the places where it is required. And uh, I have been in contact with the uh, High Commissioner and the Consular General and also the high-ranking officials in the uh, Foreign Ministry and some uh, elected officials uh, got in touch with me. So we'll look at uh, opportunities. I'll discuss with Premier and Minister of Health to see how uh, Alberta can uh, collaborate uh, in removing their uh, difficulties. But I saw also some news yesterday or this morning. Government of India actually is uh, procuring 100,000 portable uh, oxygen concentrators and also additionally more than 1,000 uh, PSWs, uh, which are uh, oxygen generators, with actually local technology. Their uh, Defense Research Development Organization developed indigenous technology so they can, uh, they can uh, produce oxygen near where it is required. So that, that's why every day, you know, I feel we are so lucky in Alberta with all the investment we are doing in health and uh, vital infrastructure here. And I'll actually encourage India to look at that long-term investments in infrastructure. But it's very critical for all of us to stand with India now, because uh, if we help uh, India breathe, and if they come out of this pandemic soon, they'll help all of the world with vaccines and other uh, um, generic drugs, and because they're the world leaders. But I wish them all the best. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Next question is from Adam Toy with Global News. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, hi, this is a question for the Premier or the Health Minister. Um, we have learned that there are no more AstraZeneca doses available for pharmacies and no more appointments with AHS for those AZ shots. Uh, what's your message to the tens of thousands of eligible Albertans who are hoping to get an AstraZeneca vac vaccination uh, but won't be able to. Uh, thank you. And, and first, we are going to continue to have the, the Pfizer vaccine coming and, and so, so secure supply that is coming, 119,000 and, uh, and some every week. It's going to be increasing by 100,000. Moderna, hopefully those uh, shipments no longer see those, uh, those disruptions. And, and Janssen, uh, the, the Johnson & Johnson one as well, now starting next week, as Premier said, is going to be coming into uh, to Alberta. So the AstraZeneca, we're, we're hoping uh, to continue to um, procure more in the, uh, the coming months. Uh, there are some opportunities we have in, in being able to obtain AstraZeneca through uh, the federal government. Just a reminder, though, to, to everybody that Alberta can't buy um, uh, vaccines. Uh, vaccines are not uh, procured or not developed here locally in Canada. We have to procure it from other countries. We, uh, um, the, the, the approval process through the federal government allows them to uh, confirm that they have the exclusivity in purchasing all those, those, uh, those doses. So t we are uh, waiting for the federal government to continue to procure further AstraZeneca. Uh, for the rural pharmacies, uh, of course, we want to continue to make sure that they have a continued supply. Uh, as people are making their appointments, they're making appointments for vaccines that haven't yet arrived here in Alberta. And so as people make their appointments when they're eligible in the, uh, the four groups in, uh, in phase two, A, B, C, and D, uh, then when they make those appointments, we then ship, as the vaccines arrive in, in Alberta, we ship those vaccines where those appointments have been made throughout the province through our community partners like the, the pharmacies or AHS sites as well. So we'll continue to, to make sure that those supplies are there for, um, for pharmacies and AHS throughout the province. Oh, sure.
sorry, I just wanted to uh, add a point or two, which is that, uh, first of all, um, 10 days ago, we had uh, a problem of AstraZeneca supplies piling up and people not using them. So we had about 170,000 doses in fridges across the province it's Sunday of last week, uh, about 10 days back. And um, that's when we decided to open up the age categories to 40 and above. And I just want to say that while this is a problem and we're, we're very we share the frustration of people uh, who are now queued up and can't get that AZ vaccine, uh, that uh, at least we got those, those shots into the arms of people that they're no longer sitting on shelves, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, one of the reasons for the supply shortage there is actually relates to uh, Mr. Nagar's earlier question about what's happening in India. Uh, India is supposed to be our major supplier of AstraZeneca, but because of the crisis there, they have banned, at least temporarily, uh, vaccine exports uh, to deal with their own population. Uh, it's regrettable, but understandable. It's another sign of vaccine nationalism and another reason why we've got to develop our own, be able to produce our own vaccines here at home in the future. Adam, do you have a quick follow-up? Yeah, just wondering if you expect this to uh, impact the race between vaccination and this third wave, uh, yeah. and, and if you can speak to how that will impact it. Well, yes, because every um, every delay in supply uh, is is a is a loss in that race, unfortunately. Um, and the big problem is this: that we didn't have adequate supply in the first three months of this year. Unlike the U.S., uh, Israel, U.K., and so many other countries, uh, we were slow off the start getting our hands on vaccines in Canada, um, and that gave the variants time to spread, and that's how we ended up in this uh, in this third wave. But uh, I, I do have some, I think, uh, good news just to amplify what Minister Chandra was saying, is uh, that we are expecting to be precise. Some, some large shipments in the next couple of weeks. Um, as he said, starting on Monday with uh, Johnson & Johnson's Janssen vaccine, um, we are expecting uh, fairly large shipments. Uh, we now have, uh, as of last night, um, 59,000 doses of AstraZeneca in current inventory. Of course, many of those are already out in pharmacies and waiting to be put in people's arms. Um, and here's the problem. We have 76,000 doses booked to be administered in the next seven days. So you're right. Demand is now outstripping uh, supply uh, in that respect. And um, we are expecting uh, next week to receive 236,000 Pfizer doses. In the week following, another 236,000 Pfizer's plus 117,000 Moderna's and the Johnson & Johnson. So I actually think that in the month of May, we may be able to inoculate with the first dose um, up, upwards of 700,000 people, and that'll be a game changer for sure. Operator, can you please put through our last caller? Final question is from Francois Jolie with CBC. Go ahead, Francois. Uh, bonjour. Uh, question in uh, English and French, if I may, uh, for Premier. Um, Premier Kenny, um, HF has a protocol for triage uh, for if we get in a situation where demand exceeds capacity for COVID care in Alberta hospitals. Um, how close is the province to implement that kind of protocol? Uh, so you want that in English and French, Francois? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my understanding is that AHS has uh, protocols for uh, triage generally, but uh, they're doing work on updating that based on uh, advice and input from uh, their advisory group. Um, and uh, I expect that they'll be uh, publishing a revised a triage protocol specifically with respect to intensive care in the fairly near, near future. Many provinces did this last year, um, and it's only prudent uh, to prepare for that. To be clear, uh, right now, uh, we have capacity to deal with this surge. Uh, we cannot take that for granted, uh, but we are able to, um, we've worked very hard th through AHS uh, by giving them all the resources they need uh, to expand ICU capacity uh, to deal with a, a kind of worst case scenario in the pandemic. 
and um, we believe that they can accommodate up to 425 uh, functional staffed uh, ICU beds for COVID patients should it be necessary. Uh, we, uh, but we obviously don't want to push the, the limits on that. And that's why we renew our call on Albertans. Please, please follow the public health measures and restrictions that are in place so we are not put in anything like that kind of a position. Um, en français, I also just say the same thing in French. Um, uh, uh, Al um, le gouvernement de l'Alberta et les, les services de santé de l'Alberta uh, a toujours certaines balises uh, pour uh, le triage de soins médicaux et, et il y a une démarche actuelle uh, à les services de santé de l'Alberta pour um, faire une uh, pr précision de, des critères pour le triage de soins intensifs uh, dans le contexte évidemment de COVID-19. Plusieurs autres provinces ont fait exactement la même chose l'année dernière. Et je crois que euh, le, le service de santé ici euh, sera prêt de, de, de publier euh, les critères euh, prochainement. Mais il faut dire que nous avons les capacités actuellement. Euh, avec l'élargissement de capacité, nous pouvons accommoder euh, environ 425 euh, euh, personnes avec le COVID-19 dans le soins les lits de soins intensifs. Mais c'est essentiel que les Albertains euh, suivent les euh, mesures de santé publique pour que nous puissions, pour que, pour que nous évitions euh, ce euh, scénario-là. François, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, uh, oui, encore une fois en français et en anglais. Um, you, you've said that you knew for a long time, for three weeks, that we would get to that 20,000 um, active cases that that had been foreseen for a long time. Are you, like, where are you willing to go? Are you willing to go down the road of a place where Alberta needs a triage system for, for intensive care before uh, implementing further restrictions? No. Well, first of all, let me just say this about further restrictions. Um, the notion that there's a, a direct linear relationship between the restrictions and uh, viral spread is not the experience of this pandemic. Uh, properly tar targeted restrictions that people actually comply with can be a useful tool in limiting viral spread. Uh, but uh, indiscriminate restrictions that people ignore broadly are not an effective tool. And there are so many different uh, examples and counter examples around the world. You know, uh, Peru had, uh, in the first wave of COVID, by far the uh, strongest and longest lasting uh, lockdown in the world. And they also had one of the worst uh, rates of infection and fatality. Right now, our measures are broadly similar. Um, in, some res mo in most respects, almost identical to those of British Columbia. Their numbers are going down in, Al in BC, but they're going up in Alberta. Look at Toronto, where they've been in pretty much a hard lockdown since December, and they've had a real problem, of course, with, with high numbers uh, putting big pressure on their healthcare system. So I, I, I try to convey that, that, that there's, there's, I think, a false idea out there that we can just, that, that quote unquote lockdowns stop viral spread and that they can be effective in every instance. That's not the case. Um, and uh, But I will say that we are actively considering additional targeted measures, particularly in areas that are being hardest hit. And uh, let me be absolutely clear, this government will not allow our healthcare system to be overwhelmed. The number one thing that we focus on every day is the capacity, particularly of our intensive care units. And uh, while there is pressure now, and that pressure will grow, over the next two to three weeks based on the current number of active cases. We as Albertans need to pull together uh, to make sure that we do not put too much pressure on the healthcare system and those working on the front lines in urgent care. Uh, and uh, I'll say the same thing in French, um, briefly. Uh, pour dire que il n'y a pas nécessairement un lien exact entre les mesures, les restrictions de santé publique et le contrôle des virus. Uh, nous pouvons voir plusieurs exemples des juridictions avec les restrictions très dures 
qui ont eu les vagues euh, de, de virus très sérieux. Et autres juridictions, comme la Colombie-Britannique Colombie actuellement, avec les mesures euh, pareilles à celles de l'Alberta, où les chiffres diminuent. Alors, l'essentiel est que le grand public suive les mesures et les restrictions. Et ça, c'est notre focus. Mais cela étant dit, nous considérons actuellement les mesures supplémentaires ciblées, ciblées euh, particulièrement dans les régions plus affectées. Et euh, ce gouvernement ne permettra pas le système de santé, particulièrement les, les sections de soins en, 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 intensifs, euh, d'être abordées en ce qui concerne euh, la demande. Merci beaucoup. Ça conclut notre temps aujourd'hui. Merci à tous. Prenez soin.